Good afternoon. I, I want to welcome everybody to what I'm sure will be an engaging and very, very timely discussion. I want to start by thanking the School of Public Health and the Watson Institute for International and Public Affairs for hosting this event. And I'm thrilled to have our new Dean of the School of Public Health, Ashish Jha, moderating today's conversation. I want to thank our panelists, uh, Junaid Ahmad, Lois Pace, John Nkengasong, and Ed Steinfeld for taking the time to be with us today. Uh, I'm Chris Paxson, I'm president of Brown, and I'm glad to be here too. I'm looking forward to it because it's hard to imagine a more important topic than global public health in the wake of the presidential election, the US presidential election. For nearly a year now, and it's hard to believe it's been that long, we have been dealing with the pandemic. And to date, more than 50 million people have contracted the virus. It's claimed at least 1.2 million lives worldwide. And the United States, as I think most of us know, has registered more coronavirus, coronavirus cases and deaths of any country in the world. And cases are continuing to increase in many countries across the globe. So we're fed, heading into what might be a pretty grim winter, sadly. We're facing questions about when a viable vaccine will become widely available and really hard ethical questions. Who's gonna have access to it first at a time when the US has increasingly retreated from leadership on the international health stage? And you know, I think it's also important to remember while we're so, and rightly so, uh, interested in, in, I was going to say obsessed with what's happening with coronavirus, it's so important. It's also important to remember that it's far from being the only pressing global health issue. There are many. And just to name one, the effects of climate change have become increasingly evident. And this comes at a time when the US has withdrawn from the Paris Climate Agreement. Maybe that won't last long, uh, but we haven't been in the game for some time. So, you know, these are issues of incredible consequence, not only in terms of global public health, but also in terms of economics and in terms of ethics. The question we're facing now is what leadership and international engagement we can expect from the new presidential administration. And we also have to consider the long-term impacts of the previous administration. Things don't just turn on a dime. Now, as, as you know, and we've been saying this repeatedly in the previous months, Brown is a nonprofit, nonpartisan institution. And that fact has to guide everything that we do as a university. While we can't engage in political advocacy, what we can always do and what we, we have an obligation to do is to engage in a spirit of free inquiry and attention to scientific knowledge and facts as we grapple with difficult issues. There's no doubt that this has been a challenging and contentious political cycle. And it's exactly at times like this that I think that what we do at Brown matters most. You know, what do we do? We consider complex consequential issues. We work to pursue solutions through education, research and service. It's this work that is core to who we are. It's core to our mission. And today's discussion is just one example of that work. So I'm looking forward to a stimulating conversation ahead. And again, thanks to all of you for being here. And I will turn it over to Dean Shah. Thank you. Thank you, President Paxson, um, for not just getting us started, but really framing uh, the moment that we're in and the issues that are in front of us. Um, I'm gonna get to the panel very quickly, but I wanna do a little bit of housekeeping first. Um, just a reminder, this is this panel, this event is really part of a series of events uh, that Brown University has been hosting in the aftermath of the election to help us better understand the impact of the election on all sorts of important issues from domestic public health to international relations to our society to issues around race and justice. And today's focus really is going to be about the impact of the election on global public health and international relations. Now, before I introduce our panel, two more quick things. Uh, this event is being recorded and will be on the websites of both the Watson Institute and the School of Public Health. Um, for those of you who are on Zoom, you can submit questions through the Q&A and we'll try to get to as many of them as possible. And it is also being live streamed by the Watson Institute's YouTube channel 
uh, which is also closed captioned. And you can submit questions through there, which we'll also try our best to get, get to. Now, let's get to the main event, which is this incredible panel that we have put together. And they all have long distinguished careers, none of which I'm going to get into in any, with any great detail, because I want to actually hear what they're thinking. But let me very quickly tell you who they are. The first uh, person is Junaid Ahmad. He's a highly regarded, well-known international economist. Uh, he's the, currently the country director of the World Bank in India. And uh, as, uh, as we started this conversation just before we came on, uh, he is a proud Brown alumnus. And therefore, uh, even though it's, it's late at night in India, he is willing to pay the Brown tax and join us today. So I'm thrilled about that. Um, the next person kind of on my list is Lois Pace. I've, I've known Lois for many years. She is the executive director of the Global Health Council. Uh, she has worked in global health on the front lines in country, in 10 different countries, uh, delivering and, and really uh, mobilizing resources for health. Um, she's also on uh, President-elect Biden's uh, coronavirus task force. And uh, we probably will not get into a lot of issues around that task force today, but uh, just FYI. Uh, next is John Kingasong, uh, who is the first director of the Africa CDC. And for those of you who don't know or have not been watching as much what's been happening with this disease outbreak in Africa, uh, I believe it's hard for me to imagine anybody who's been more consequential in helping that entire continent through one of the great, biggest public health crises of our times. And uh, we are incredibly delighted to have John with us. And then last but certainly not least is my uh, Brown colleague, Ed Steinfeld, who is the Howard Swearer Director of the Watson Institute, professor of Chinese uh, studies and uh, political science at Brown University. So that's our panel. It's a great lineup. And I'm gonna just start off with a very high level question, um, which is I, the supposition behind this event is that this was a very consequential election, that the election of Vice President Biden uh, is consequential compared to an alternative where, where Mr. Trump might have won. So first of all, the question is, do you agree it is consequential? And I'm specifically thinking in terms of global public health and, and for Ed, maybe international relations more broadly. And then if it is consequential, what do you think the consequences are of the election uh, turning in the direction that it has versus if it had gone the other way? And I am gonna start off uh, with Janaid and then I'll go to Lois, John and Ed. Uh, Ashish, thanks. And it's an absolute pleasure to uh, be back at uh, Brown University. Um, uh, Ashish, I have to say that for a Bangladeshi like me, every US election is consequential. And the impact that the United States has globally, uh, we have felt uh, from 1970, 71, when we were a country that uh, fought for its independence and US was not on our side to today, uh, where US plays a role. So my, my perspective is not whether it was Mr. Trump who won or Mr. Biden who wins. Uh, mine is the fact that every time there is a US election, it matters. And I think uh, where it matters particularly now is what kind of a global system will emerge. Bretton Woods institutions, IMF, World Bank, the United Nations emerged out of uh, the chaos of World War II. I think coronavirus should be seen in exactly the same way. I think coronavirus has pushed the limits to where we consider ourselves globally connected and to see whether we can create a global response to a global disease. And in particularly whether we have a system that can create a global safety net for countries and for people around the world. And I think that uh, as a world banker, as a, as a diehard multilateralist, I would say time has come for us to rewrite multilateralism because climate change and Corona tells us we live in a world of shared sovereignty, not in, uh, in terms of separate sovereignty. And if it's shared sovereignty, we have to rewrite the rules of global engagement in where one country's, uh, country's decisions affect another, where groups of countries' decisions affect the globe, who mediates, how does it mediate? So the only point that I would say is every time there's a US election, multilateralists like me ask the question, where will the new president take multilateralism? Because I think global, uh, the pandemic and climate change have made it very clear 
that a new multilateralism must be created. Fabulous. Great, great start. Lois, um, consequential, yes or no? And then if yes, how? Yeah, no, of course. I, I, um, I too appreciate being here and certainly um, I'm grateful to Janae for uh, kicking us off so well. Um, you know, for me, I'm sitting here thinking also about um, the fact that while every U.S. election is consequential, for me as an American, we haven't quite had public health and global health specifically at the forefront in a way that it has been this year, right? And um, it's funny because I, I think uh, with each cycle, you have advocates like me really pushing uh, any uh, candidate uh, for uh, progress in this space and for them to prioritize this work. And we're constantly told that foreign policy and specifically foreign assistance or foreign affairs just really isn't a voting issue. And so this year, it's sort of that assumption was very much turned on its head. Um, I think um, it, for that reason, and given I think what we all are aware transpired uh, throughout the year with global health, particularly with the Trump administration, um, it's definitely fair to say that both uh, or either would have taken different approaches to, to global health. Uh, we saw with President Trump, his uh, disengagement from uh, the World Health Organization, you know, other decisions um, that, that they made around global health institutions and engagement and sort of uh, the our history and leadership in this space as a country. And so you have now a president elect Biden who has already said on day one, he'll reverse the decision around WHO and as well as touch on other areas, right? So really looking at, as President Paxson was saying, uh, it's not just about COVID, the, the consequences of this election and US leadership, but also you have something like sexual and reproductive health and some of the decisions that were made in that regard. Um, by this administration and, and a president-elect Biden coming in and also um, uh, presumably reversing some of those decisions or actions. And so um, regardless of, of the differences between the two on COVID, there are these other, I guess, ripple effects or consequences of, uh, of, of who comes in um, next year. And so I uh, appreciate the, the question and looking forward to digging more into what uh, president-elect Biden administration's uh, policies might entail. Great, thank you. That's really helpful. And John, I'm going to come to you next. And and uh, sitting in Addis, sitting by the African Union, um, how consequential do you think uh, this U.S. election is uh, for global public health more writ large, but also for uh, the African continent, especially around obviously around public health. Oops, I think you're muted. John, I think you're muted. Okay, good. Perfect. Thank you. I think a couple of things. Um, it is very clear that one, uh, when the United States have led, the world has always been in a better place in terms of uh, global public health. And there are several examples for us to show where, from the perspective that where I sit. I think they're saying that your, your stand in any issue is where you sit. I think uh, sitting in Africa and seeing the world, uh, we, I remember vividly in, in, in the early 2000s working in Cote d'Ivoire where Tony Fauci and the, 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 the Bush administration they visited and then PEPFAR was created. And it was a turning point in, in our ability to fight HIV AIDS in, in not just in Africa, but in the whole world. I think that sh really shows leadership. I mean, if the United States leads, the world uh, uh, succeeds. Uh, I mean, I think we've learned from this crisis that uh, there is clearly we are more connected than we we, we, th we thought we were, uh, that we are more vulnerable than we thought we were, and that um, uh, that inequities that defines global public health are just everywhere. I think that the virus has exposed and amplified those inequities there. If you look at the, um, our global health uh, security index, a uh, way we used to pride ourselves with different colors of the, the world and whatever, it fell apart. I think we have to be humble enough to say that how do we uh, look back at that global health security index, look back at our joint uh, external evaluation scores and say, look, let's sit back and take a deep breath and say, what does leadership really mean in terms of making sure that this 
uh, global health security index align with the reality. I think that we have to be very humble enough to, uh, to admit that um, we are more connected. And so I would just say that there are, there, are, there are four underpinnings of what we need to look at going forward. The ability to that this leadership for the new administration has to really emphasize cooperation, uh, collaboration, coordination and communication. Those four C's should really define where we go from here in terms of um, the US leadership and the world's uh, following and I think making the world a better place. Sorry, now I was muted. Thank you, John. <laughs> All right, Ed, um, uh, again, thank you for co-sponsoring this with us and, and really being a, a great partner on this. Ed, as a as a keen observer, certainly of China, though your, your purview is much broader than that, um, I was, I mean, I don't want you to look at like whether from a foreign policy point of view, obviously it's a consequential election. But one of the interesting things that I just want, wonder if I can set up a little bit is that this is a place where the global public health issues and our relationship with China ran head into each other and got very intermeshed. So sort of go wherever you want with the kind of question of how do you see the impact of this election on uh, America's engagement in the world? But I'm particularly interested in your take on how you saw that play out, um, the, the public health and the China issues coming up the way they did. So please. Thank you so much, Ashish. It's so great to be here. And it's an honor to be here with all of you. The election is, is of course consequential. So my answer to your question is yes, but. And, and the but, I want to get back to how Junaid started us on the panel with his call, an appropriate one for a new kind of multilateralism and, and, a, and a rethinking of what the rules are globally. So we're in a, a tough situation with China and vice versa. In China, in recent years, there have been some challenging trends. There's a new kind of ethno-nationalism and a jingoism and various kinds of counterproductive efforts, whether with respect to Uyghurs in Xinjiang or Chinese citizens in Hong Kong. And that's, of course, raised alarms. And then on the US side, in ways that transcend this election or the current administration, there has been, to some extent, a, a demonization of China, a racialization of policy toward China. And frankly, I something that goes back to the Obama administration, a framing of the discourse as if we Americans don't write the rules, then the Chinese will write the rules. And that, that kind of zero sum framing is I think quite counterproductive. That's not a new kind of multilateralism. There's no political appetite I think in the US across the spectrum for a warm embrace of China. And maybe such an embrace isn't appropriate, but I will say that within China in, recent years and recent decades, really, we've seen a substantial ramp ramping up of expertise, scientific expertise in organizations like the Chinese CDC and in the, in the healthcare system. We've seen a ramping up of innovations surrounding a variety of different kinds of technologies to monitor the situation, to respond. So there are people to engage and there are positive lessons to learn. And I think we do have to find ways to be reasonable and to engage on both sides, not necessarily to come to some kind of rapprochement, but really to think about a new way of writing rules together that will start addressing some of these problems that are clearly common problems, whether it's public health or climate or any other number of problems. Great. Um, okay, that has about, leads me down about four or five different paths across the comments you've all made. So I'm gonna start um, by really getting to the heart of what I heard in several people's uh, responses, which is the architecture for global health. And I'm gonna be way too simplistic for a second and sort of describe it. I mean, it's obviously the global health infrastructure and architecture is very complicated, but in some ways we see central to it, the World Health Organization. Um, and uh, and then you see this kind of, you know, ministers of health and, and the health and governments really this being representing the voice of governments. Um, how do you feel like um, WHO has done in this pandemic? And if we're going to re-envision a new um, global system, what is the role of WHO going to be in such a system? And Janaid, because you got us started on this in re-envisioning and rewriting the multilateralism, 
how do you think that um, that has to be done? Like what needs to look different uh, as we move forward? And, and, and if to the extent that you're comfortable and want to reflect on WHO's performance, I'd love to hear your thoughts on that as well. Well, first, um, we, the World Bank, uh, are a, are, our partnership with WHO is extremely important. So in India, for example, we're working together on fighting tuberculosis. And WHO has, in the field, across all states, uh, uh, professionals that are supporting state capability. And we come in uh, with the whole issue of finance and management around, uh, around pandemic. So the partnership is, is extremely, extremely important. So when I look towards the future of what multilateralism um, should be, I think that we have to break the narrow uh, siloed approach uh, to the work we do. One of the things that uh, I worry is that when the pandemic hit, we looked at the world from lives versus livelihoods that uh, if you really want to support lives, you've got to slow down livelihoods, you know, the whole, uh, whole uh, flattening of the curve. And I think that one of the reasons why this absolutely impossible dichotomy was put on the ground is public policy and scientists are not talking to each other. Pure scientists are not talking to economists. Economists are not talking to sociologists. So we're not learning from each other in how to deal with something that should not be about lives versus livelihoods, right? I mean, which leader could actually go out and say, I'm, I'm going to take away your livelihoods uh, to save you. And in a country like India, my own Bangladesh, when you do that, it's impossible uh, to uh, separate the two. So I think that one of the things that I, I think we need to look at is how do you create a collaboration between a World Bank and WHO that is not in a silo? that is far more integrated. You know, I'm actually a, a, a how should, let me provoke, let me be provocative. I think that a World Bank should have shares in the WHO. A World Bank should have shares in, in the African Development Bank, that some of our staff should be in the African Development Bank. Unless you create this bridge across multilateral institutions, you're not going to be able to create a global safety net or a global organization. The 19th street, IMF and World Bank, that street is a narrow street and yet it's, it's as big as uh, the Grand Canyon, right? We need to figure out how to work together. And I think uh, uh, we have Kristalina who, who has uh, grown up in the World Bank context is now the head of the IMF. If you listen to the way she talks about monetary policy, it's crossing into a development policy angle. So for me, a future multilateralism has to be one where the multilateral organizations are far more connected and the walls have broken. Uh, and that's a different WHO and that's a different uh, World Bank. Okay, I love that. And so th this idea of collaboration across multilaterals has been around for a long time. And you're saying, talking about it is great. Let's actually start doing it by integrating in, in critical ways across institutions. Lois. Yeah, well, presumably this is, well, it, it, it is or should be happening already. And so something that happened last year, probably too quietly, was this launch of a global action plan on essentially health goals, right? Global health goals. And the whole premise behind that was to have each of these agencies, including WHO and the World Bank, but also organizations like Gavi, the Vaccine Alliance and the Global Fund and the like to come together around these collective objectives, right? These, these common goals that they all share with UNICEF and others around global health. This is pre-pandemic, mind you, right? And so ideally coming into this year, each of those agencies could have deployed that framework, could have really utilized each of those recommendations across these various pillars that they had outlined in terms of how they would work together, you know, across their various systems. Now we all know how complicated that can be at a governmental level, let alone at an intergovernmental level or multilateral level, but that was the that was the dream, right? And there are many of us who are calling on those agencies to recall that effort that was just you know it's just a year old, uh, and um, because it's because that is the way we should be working. And kudos to them for recognizing pre-emergency that that was important. And frankly, I think what we saw it was driven by countries, and so that's another important piece of this for me, which is 
how we shift multilateralism is to ensure that is done even more so from the ground up. Now, granted, you already have governance structures driven by member states who dictate the work of each of these agencies. But really, when it comes to the work, there's still, we were hearing from countries like, you know, like Ghana, where work is being done, or, or like Germany, you know, a major donor really saying, oh, it would be very helpful though if you all actually did that a lot better. And so what this gap or global action plan was also intended to do was to kind of put the power in these in the hands of countries. And I'm what I mean is not just those governments ideally, but also those citizens to say, this is how ideally you work with us. <laughs> and, and so this is what we need. You go huddle, get your acts together, get your affairs in order, and then come back to us with a clear plan a coordinated one, as John was saying, as to how you can help us. So that for me is really getting more into the ideal of how not just WHO, but these other organizations could or should work. Um, the, the good news, at least on the side of WHO, coming back to how they fared, is that they there has been an ongoing evaluation of the agency led by even Dr. Tedros, right? From day one, him coming in and saying, I know WHO needs work and I'm ready to make that happen. And you have also these um, ongoing uh, evaluation processes, even in the midst of COVID and almost especially due to COVID. Um, and so that's, that's good news. Uh, but the, and we will hear more from those sort of various bodies or committees. The reality is WHO is still very much hamstrung by its own structure, right? So whether it's member states giving money that's earmarked and not sort of generalized funds or WHO not necessarily having the authority uh, to enter a country, let alone um, sort of give a critique of, its, of, of a country's response. Um, those are real shortcomings that also member states, or countries and citizens have a responsibility to, to push for change on. So it's gonna take all of us really showing up differently, but the, the bones are there, right? Like we, we have the tools we need to make change. It's really a matter of how we utilize those tools. Great. Um, I love that sort of country driven ground up ways of rethinking global governance. John, I'm going to switch gears a little bit uh, because I, I want to get to a couple other questions and then I've seen, I see some questions coming in through the Q&A as well. And you brought up the Global Health Security Index. Um, there have been a lot of efforts to look at things like preparedness and preparedness of countries. And many of these metrics that people had developed. And I, you know, I've been involved in developing some of those metrics on how prepared our countries uh, for uh, disease outbreaks, often put the US and the UK at the top of the list of most prepared and put many of the countries uh, on the African continent as among the least prepared. And the, <laughs> the, the performance of, of countries in this pandemic, let us just say, has not followed closely to what those preparedness metrics uh, examined. And they tended to look at things like surveillance systems and laboratory capacity and public health workforce, et cetera. So I guess I have two related questions for you, John, which is, what do you think those metrics got wrong? And and I'm gonna, I wanna get to the heart of a question that I really would love to hear your thoughts on, which is how do you think um, the African continent, and I guess large diverse continent with lots of different places doing very differently. So you can't paint too broad a stroke, but how do you think that the African continent has done as largely as well as it has in this pandemic? What are the key features? So what's, what about those metrics have we not been quite measuring correctly and then help us all better understand uh, how things have gone across the continent, across Africa. So, no, thank you. Let me um, maybe uh, divide my thoughts into two here because this is a complex question about the Africa's performance and the, the metrics as a whole. But I would like to maybe um, touch very briefly on what uh, uh, Lois just mentioned about well, how you frame it about the global health um, uh, uh, architecture. I believe strongly that we, um, uh, we have to have a strong WHO but an empowered WHO. But then we have to really begin to argue for a new public health order where that strong and empowered WHO begins to begin to balance the powers between the regional uh, 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 bodies 
like the Africa CDC and then the national structures. You cannot over centralize uh, uh, a security response. I think it's like putting all your army, your navy, your marine, and everything in Washington DC and expecting that you can protect the United States is wrong. It's, I think it's a concept that was conceived in 1947 uh, where a continent like Africa was just about 250 million uh, people. Today we are 1.3 billion. You cannot over centralize our dependency in Geneva. That, that doesn't work anymore. I think that is very, very clear. I just wanted to underscore that, that is, um, we need that balancing of power now. Now, for the uh, um, Global Health Security Index, I think there's clearly the capacity and capabilities are, are, are in those, uh, the countries of, of the North, for sure, the surveillance system, the laboratory systems. But there are four Ps that govern uh, an effective uh, uh, response. I mean, there's the, the population, the pathogen, the, the policies and the politics. If you get any of those mixed up, then you are in trouble. I think that you may have the wonderful capacities for the, the to, to, to sequence the virus, but if the politics is messed up and the policies are wrong, you just you waste your time. I think. Then, what do we do in Africa? Before I, I came to uh, Cambridge and where I met in your office, we convened all the ministers of health. Our first case of COVID-19 was uh, showed up in Egypt on the 14th of February, and at that time we had trained countries that had. Direct air route, uh, 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 direct flights to China. We brought them to Senegal, trained them on the diagnostics, and we're hoping that our first cases will all come from China. Now, the, most of our cases ten, uh, came from Europe, uh, with the exception of Egypt. So, on the 14th of February, the first cases were uh, uh, reported in Egypt. We I advised the chairperson of the Africa Union. I said, "Look, bring all the ministers of health together in uh, in Addis Ababa." And uh, we tell them exactly what to do. I think we, and they all came. When we convened that meeting, they said, John, somebody came to my office and said, John, why do you want to uh, 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 set yourself up for failure? The ministers will not come, but 40 of them came. Those who were traveling, like the Minister of Health of Nigeria in, in, in Europe, routed and came back to Addis Ababa because of the, the urgency there. There we agree on the joint continental strategy. I mean, that the joint continental strategy that said we must cooperate. We must coordinate our efforts and we must do the same thing. So when they left and the, the first week of March cases started showing up around the continent, they did exactly what we, had, we had, had advised them to do. We also have a task force. I mean, we're one of the first uh, continent that have the task force that meets every week at 4 p.m. East African time in our emergency operations center to bring the entire continent together to adjust strategy and discuss strategy and share experiences there. So I think that, that we didn't have the, the, the capacity as you have in the United States, but we have the policies were right, the coordination was right, and the, policy, the, and the politics. The head of states have put me at the 15 of them, the Bureau of the Head of States, eight times. Okay, that is nearly every four weeks, President Amaposa, as the chair of the African Union, we say, John, you come in here, tell us where we are with this pandemic. What is the strategy? What should we do? I mean, eight times, it's unprecedented. I've been in public health for 30 years and I've never seen that amount of coordination there where the President Kagame, President uh, uh, Sisi in Egypt, they all, I mean, listening to, to the Africa CDC, a nascent organization, giving them a, a, a direction. I think those are some of the elements that have been, I mean, and they have really shown that spirit of cooperation in four areas. We developed a PAC strategy, which is a partnership to accelerate COVID testing, where we realized that the diagnostics were not there. So we, we created PAC to really accelerate testing. Today, we really ramp up that testing from May to where we are today. We created a common platform called the African Medical Supply Platform, where each country can go in there and just like Amazon.com and, and shop for the commodities there. You can all Google and see that AMSP.Africa. Now we've created a fund, the COVID response fund for the continent where countries pool their resources and we use them for. So I think all of that made it over, they compensated for a lack of laboratory capacity, lack of uh, uh, surveillance. They're just the policies and the politics I believe were right and they listened to the leadership. No one has ever argued about wearing masks. I think I've been doing right now of the, the continent to really keep uh, encouraging the politicians and the leadership say, look, don't relent, no, no complacency, and I think, and they, and they listen. I mean, they immediately adhere to what we are telling them. I think those are some of just the early reflections. Wow. I mean, 
it's just such stark contrast to what we have seen in the United States, where we have no shortage of resources, but the complete lack of coordination, the complete lack of the, and the policies and the politics uh, and how it has gotten involved has been really impressive. I, I think, again, I, I think there is a, um, a lot to be done to really understand how the continent has done what it has done. Um, Ed, I'm, I, I want to come back to a point that you made. Um, it is in the global architecture of, I mean, in the architecture around global health, but I, I think these are issues in broader uh, international relations. We often now think of China as our quote unquote main competitor and, uh, and think, well, if we walk away, and I probably am I'm guilty of doing this. When, w, when America walked away from WHO, I made the point, which now I feel a little chagrin. I probably should have asked you, but I wasn't at Brown yet. Um, you know, I made the point that the biggest beneficiary of this would be China. I don't even actually know that that's quite right. And, and let me just frame the question in this way, which is, it doesn't seem to me like China's engagement with these kind of global structures is the same kind of engagement that the United States has. In fact, it seems to have taken a very different approach to global engagement. So how do you see um, China's role in, in arenas like global public health or sort of how does it engage in these multilateral institutions? Um, and where do you see that going over the, over the next five, 10 years uh, as China, I think becomes more and more emboldened as a global power that it is? Thanks, Ashish. Let me just say generally, and this to some extent comes back to a point that, that Lois had made earlier about citizens and what their expectations are. I think we should put aside the fantasy that member states and multilateral institutions don't try to exert their political will and political interest. They do it at various points. The United States has done it. China's done it. But that, that's just reality. It's always been and it will always continue to be. Also, let's put aside the reality that various member states don't, at sometimes, whether because of sovereignty or political convenience, they hide or distort information. It's a widespread phenomenon. It's appropriate to call out China for doing that this time for a brief period of time. It's important to call China out for doing it in 2003 with SARS at a longer period of time. But alas, the United States is fallen into the game of politicizing information, vilifying scientists and empirical information. So unfortunately, we're all playing in that space, not all playing the same, but playing in that space. I think more directly with regard to your question, look, China's a complicated place like any other place, and it engages multilateral organizations for a variety of reasons. One, and these aren't all reconcilable, one, sure, they're power reasons. And China does want, or aspects of pieces of China do want to exert their will on these organizations and probably do in some cases want to write rules in ways that will serve China's national interests. There's also though a big constituency in China and the Chinese government that recognizes that there are a bunch of common problems, pandemics, climate change, and realize that if they don't engage multilateral institutions, the problems aren't going to get resolved. And for sure, China's neighbors learned that lesson in 2003 with SARS, which led to greater information sharing and more reliance on expertise and frankly, more trust among the publics and their governments because of the response uh, in 2003. But I'll add a third thing that's a little different in China from, from in the US. I think because China is in kind of a, is in kind of a self-described process of modernization and self-described process of still becoming. Engaging global organizations supports the identity in China of being modern, of being global. And, and that's not a negative thing. That's not necessarily a zero sum thing. It's, it's about a seat at the table and that reinforcing an identity of having arrived. Whereas in the US where that may have been true, now participating in those institutions seems to cut against Amer many Americans identity and that's a problem. And I, I just conclude by saying, I hope that when we encounter the first of the phenomenon I, I mentioned where China or any other country trying to exert its will, we don't run away entirely from the enterprise of engaging in multilateral institutions because there are constituencies to engage in China. There are interests to engage in China. And frankly, as again, China's neighbors learned in 2003, we have to engage or else we will 
fall prey to things like pandemics, unfortunately, as we're experiencing now. And so much of the rest of the world, including places like China, are looking at Americans. And there may be a tiny amount of schadenfreude, but there's a lot more concern about how terribly we failed on the governance side and what that means for the world when the US fails in this fashion. And so let me just get like one quick follow up on this. Um, so if you were advising the, the Biden administration, um, the stance on China in terms of its engagement in global public health, first of all, it sounds like you would, uh, you would in, encourage a lot more engagement and you would encourage um, China to play a more active role in these global organizations or how would you, how, what should the Biden administration be doing vis-a-vis -vis China, really with the lens towards strengthening global public health? Look, I think we have to acknowledge and in fact encourage China to play a greater role by virtue of its size on many different dimensions. I think we have to move away from the framing of if, if we don't drive the rules, they drive the rules. That, that's just not very constructive. It's actually not constructive for trade. It's not constructive for labor regulation. It's not constructive for environmental, not because we Americans should somehow yield to China, but rather the old rules weren't working so well yeah. in many respects. Look at the political tensions in the US and there, there are analogous political tensions, uh, tensions in many other countries, including China. So the rules, getting back to Junaid's point, have to be rethought. And if we're not doing that collectively, those rules aren't really going to work. So the, the point is not that we're going to have our great kumbaya moment. We're not, frankly, but we have to have the discussion and we have to engage and we have to tone down all the hyperbolic rhetoric, which the political systems in many countries, including China and the United States, for different reasons, the political systems encourage the hyperbole. And we've got it tone it down. At the same time, on the United States side, on any side, we have to stand by our values and keep articulating those values when we or other countries engage in behavior that frankly is unacceptable. And I think there's just, before I go on to my kind of last question for the group, um, I'd want to say a, an important point that you raised, which strikes me as something that most Americans don't often think about, is we, we know America is not monolithic. We know that we as Americans don't have one set of views about global engagement, about, right? I mean, like historically different in fact. Well, there's actually quite a bit of heterogeneity of views within China, within the Chinese leadership. In, in their governmental structure, it can sometimes look like it's very monolithic, but engaging has the opportunity to help bring up and, and fortify voices that we think can play more constructive role. All right, uh, there are a bunch of questions that are coming to me. So before I get to them, I'm gonna ask the one last question that I feel like I kind of have to in this, so here we are, we're 10, 11 months into, 11 months into the pandemic. Um, things are gonna be bad for a little while, but we are starting to see the glimmers of what might be the light at the end of the tunnel. Progress on vaccines, uh, there's COVAX. Uh, I'm hoping and assuming that America will play a more constructive role with COVAX in terms of uh, really you know, being part of the global effort to get vaccines out. Um, what are the key lessons we need to learn from this to prevent, uh, to get us ready for the next pandemic? Because, you know, for years, a bunch of us have been saying a pandemic is coming. Well, here's a pandemic. It doesn't mean the next pandemic is any less likely. Like we haven't, there are literally people are like, well, we're done with this for a hundred years. Like we're not. Um, so what are the key lessons that you think um, that we need to implement to help make sure that the world globally is a bit, is bit better prepared, strong, uh, more effective in its response on the next one. And Junaid, I'll start with you. Um, Ashish, if you permit me, there's something I just wanted to add. Please. Just taking off from what Lois and, and John said, I appreciate that when we talk about global and multilateralism, we talk about the big players, the US and China, but if you think for a second, if CDC Africa partners with ICMR India, the world will change. Yeah. That, that, that kind of partnership of the rising uh, local organizations is a multilateralism that we need to focus and strengthen. Second is we talk through the lens of sovereign nations. What's, what's emerging is subnational governments. 
the, the relationship between subnational governments and in particular city governments is quite incredible. What I learned was New Orleans visits Dhaka city because New Orleans says, Dhaka, you flood every year. How do you manage that? We, New Orleans, we flood periodically and we have a difficult time. Those conversations are changing the nature of multilateralism. So I think it's important that even as we focus on US and China, we need to look at the, the, the subnational and local organization uh, co uh, coming, coming together. Before you, it's fabulous. And before you go on to answer the question, I'd add, I do actually think it's a really important point that I, I think is, is that too often we think of this as kind of the global superpowers engaging with these major uh, multilateral organizations. But it does seem to me, and, and this has been happening for a decade, but I think this pandemic has accelerated this, that what you are seeing is a rise of both kind of intellectual capacity, engagement, work, that's coming from quote unquote untraditional places. Now, whether they're ever untraditional, we can talk about, but, the, but you're right, like the, the, the collaboration between an Africa CDC and, and ICMR, or what, or what has happened in terms of incredible response in Southeast Asia, Vietnam has done an extraordinary job in this pandemic. And what does that mean for really understanding who are the, who are the real superpowers? It's gonna be, it's gonna get mixed up in this pandemic. So I, I think that's a point that I'm sorry I didn't make, but thank you for highlighting that. I think that is a really critical thing. Um, but if you, if you want, you can address my first question around how do we make sure we're ready for the next one or we can pass it on how, whatever you want, Janet. No, so, uh, you, I mean, I think you've asked a question that could easily be another hour of discussion. But uh, from my perspective, uh, since we all bring different biases to the, uh, to the table, from my perspective, what is very critical is the rethinking of the state. One of the things that we have discovered in this pandemic is how important the state is. It's not market who's gonna, markets that are gonna take us out of the pandemic. Uh, it won't be private sector that'll take us out of pandemic. It'll be the state. So how we organize the state in the context of the world where shocks are coming and coming more frequently, I think is a, is a big question. I'm fascinated, for example, uh, Singapore, the prime minister's office has an office of the futures. What they do in the office of the futures, which sits in the prime minister's office, is they do scenario planning of shocks going forward because they know that we are, we're in the world where fat tails are now beginning to dominate. If that's true, we have to relook at how the state must function. And in that, I look at Kerala, a localized state where the citizen and the state are next to each other is essential to deal with shocks because you need the trust of citizens and the state must be believed. And if the state is to be believed, it is a tier that's closest to the citizen that'll make the difference. So for me, focus on the nature of the state. Otherwise, dealing with zoonotic disease and everything is not going to be dealt with. That's a, that's a, that's a very rapid question to a very deep que answer to a very deep question you have raised. It, it's a fabulous answer. Um, Lois. Yeah, no, I really like the, where this is going. I, I mean, I would slap a different label perhaps on what you both have shared, but you, you issues you were even starting to answer the question, frankly, in a way that I would have, which is taking the power away from this so-called superpowers, right? Or shifting that power. There's obviously, as you know, um, have been rallying cries for the decolonization of global health, for example. Um, I think we can talk about the decolonization of development uh, broadly, but we obviously have known for a while, but certainly have seen in real time how much that framework is faulty, right? That, that premise is, is, is probably not so accurate. And so I think what it's going to take for us to do differently um, is to really shift our thinking in that framing, right? Um, so that we can, and that's not just sort of tinkering with the partnerships um, or the programs, which is critical um, in ensuring that we're, uh, sort of assigning or allocating resources differently. You know, we're granting people at a grassroots level, you know, different countries, more decision-making power and the like, but it's also in word and the narrative. And I really wanna come back to what was raised earlier in one of your questions, which is how we've talked about, you know, how other countries would fare in the wake of an emergency and really what's happened. And so I would also hope that moving forward, we would have a very different narrative 
about what it is these, again, superpowers or major nations would do um, and instead really have our messages reflect that re the reality um, that there are actors, different actors who really have shown leadership. There are disparities within these countries that need to be addressed such that we can't even say a response in one country has had sort of the same blanket positive effects um, uh, amongst all of its citizens and, and so on and so forth. So that's for me what we're focused on It's advocates moving into next year, moving into sort of the, the world beyond the pandemic is really saying, all right, well, if we're really gonna, you know, say build back better, right? As Dr. Tedros and President Mike Biden have said, how do we reimagine um, our approach to, to global health? We're not just building it back to, to where it was, but we truly are shifting, again, our thinking and our doing in the space. And my, yeah, I think that's exactly right. My sense has been that these changes began a while ago. Like when I, for instance, look at just where knowledge is produced, public health knowledge is produced, just take scientific papers. Whereas 20 years ago, it was pretty much UK and the Eastern seaboard of the United States dominating. That is not the world we live in today. That's not where the scientific knowledge is being generated. So this has been a, a, a journey that began a long time ago, but my sense is the pandemic makes it stark and it accelerates it in a way that is no longer deniable. Um, John, sitting where you're sitting, because as you said, where you stand is, depends a lot on where you sit. Um, well, I, I know you're still in the thick of getting through this pandemic, and so I apologize for asking you to help us think about uh, preventing the next one or responding more effectively to the next one. But what are the major le le lessons beyond? I mean, so you've laid out cooperation and coordination, the incredible role of leadership. W what else would you like to see from a global investment? Investments, national investments, what else would you like to see as um, the kinds of things that we need to be thinking about uh, as we make the, uh, the world better prepared for the next pandemic? Well, thank you. I think th there are two major things that I, 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 I believe strongly uh, that we, we truly need a new public health order, especially for uh, countries in, in the South. Uh, first, that says that uh, we, we tend to talk more about global health security than we actually uh, uh, do something with it. Uh, if you look at um, uh, Ebola outbreak in West Africa in 2014, uh, and my fear is that we'll start, uh, uh, when this is over, we'll start creating committees to write reports. I'll say, when they invite me to such committees, I'll say, thank you, go back and just take out those reports that you wrote and <laughs> go take out those reports that you wrote and change Ebola and replace it with a COVID-19 and you still have the same report. So I think, what's the point calling these committees? But we really have to be, be more serious and deliberate about uh, the health security, global health security. And reason, uh, as some have mentioned here, and really uh, begin to apply a mindset uh, shift where we say that um, we have to look at the global architecture, but look at regional structures and national uh, uh, structures. Global health security starts with national health security, and it fits into regional health security, then it goes to, uh, all the way to the center. If we don't have that mindset shift, it will continue to uh, spin our wheels around and not. Um, I mean, I'll give you an example. When COVID uh, hit, uh, well, and we in Africa knew that it was going to hit Africa. I remember in January, January 27, I wrote a piece in Nature Medicine. And at that time, there were 200 cases in the world. And I, I was raising an alarm for the continent of Africa. I said, Africa, we have to be prepared uh, because we will be hit by this virus. There were 200 cases in, 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 in the world. Yet I was uh, powerless because I didn't know where to get diagnostics. We, did, we knew the sequences. I'm a virologist. I could, if I had a lab, I would be doing, I would have synthesized my own primers, but we just didn't have any. And I had to send people to Berlin to go to Berlin and carry a diagnostic in a suitcase overnight to come to Addis Ababa. Then we started distributing to many uh, countries in preparation for, that has to stop, which means we have over the years uh, uh, known what needs to be done. And this has to be a uh, uh, really <coughs> inward. The African countries have to say to it that health security is as important as national uh, uh, security, and we have to invest in it in a very deliberate way. So you remove the, the World Bank for me, the African Development Bank, I own the problem. I say we have to invest in diagnostics. We have to invest in ability to do clinical trials, and then, then the bank can come in and support us, but it can be the reverse, where we are waiting for the World Bank to 
release some monies and then we we by the time that those funds trickle down you are gone i mean i think we we're very fortunate that uh, covid didn't that it started as well and we saw it uh, uh, playing out and by the time we got to africa at least we had some basics there too. so that is what i mean by that reshaping that architecture i think that is one the second and last thing is a global governance of of this we have to graduate from that dialogue of uh, a vaccine is available, we'll get all the vaccines, and then uh, the remaining ones, somebody else will get it. 2009, the H1N1 uh, 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 pandemic, if you take the newspaper articles that were published that time, and you, you wipe out 2009, you think you are in 2020, okay, that has to stop. It has to be some governance that says that uh, as the people in the world that share the same planet, we have to have a, a, a way of protecting each other and protecting each, uh, each country by sharing those common tools and goods that will be developed during uh, to fight a pandemic. So it, it can be, I mean, and, they, and that uh, uh, segues to the IHR, the instrument for uh, health security exists is I, the, the, I, the, the, the IHR, but it's not implemented. It's the, the very, very poorly respected. I think that should be a starting point. We know what we can, we have to do, but we've not done it well. Like, a, a travel and airspace. I was struggling in Africa to advise the, the head of states whether we should close the airspace or not. But I had to link to the IHR, but nobody was listening anymore because we had all panicked when we, everybody was doing what they had to do. And so it means we have to step back and pr provide some governance and empower the IHR so that it can prevent us and protect us from the next pandemic. Great. Yeah, it's interesting. I mean, I think I, I, as one of the people who won, wrote one of those Ebola reports, I have been very clear, I don't want to write another report, um, because I think, John, you're absolutely right that a lot of what we would do is take out, the, just do a find and replace Ebola for coronavirus, and then we'd, we would end up saying a lot of the same things. Uh, we're really, we're close on time, and so Ed, I'm going to ask you one last question, then I might do a quick speed round after. Um, so one of the things that's been striking in the U.S. has been that we have uh, the world's greatest military, huge investment in the military every year. Uh, and the military has been sitting and watching this pandemic. They watched their commander in chief get infected and sick, and they have largely played no real role. And there has at least begun to be some conversations in the security world that they need to take a much, much bigger role in biosecurity, but really around pandemics and disease outbreaks. Um, what do you think are the upsides and downsides, if I may ask you, it's a hard question, but you can do this, Ed. Uh, what do you think are the downsides and upsides of having really turning this into a national security issue and having the Department of Defense play a much bigger role in thinking about these issues? Well, Ashish, let me try to answer this difficult question by linking it to the previous one you asked. So we've been talking a lot about globalism and multilateralism, which is totally appropriate. But you know, the, the, the lesson I draw from the recent experience has to do with the importance really locally and nationally of trust. And when you, you look across, just to think about East Asia, countries that you know, embody a variety of different kinds of institutional setups, authoritarian systems, China, Vietnam, democracies, Taiwan, South Korea, across all of them, they had a, I would say a very impressive societal response to COVID. And I would say a lot of that has to do with trust trust in the government, trust in expertise, particularly when there's a, a crisis. And then you look at the United States where there's not trust. And for a lot of different reasons, partly, you know, we've had an almost, well, since time immemorial, gross injustices, gross inequalities, which undermine trust in the system. And then we more recently have a kind of a political drive to aggressively undermine basic you know, societal institutions, everything from, you know, political institutions to things like vaccination. And so, you know, it's very hard to see how in a society without trust, even if you have all the resources in the world or all the best agencies, you're going to get people to do the measures they need to do to, to really address pandemics. And that brings us a little bit to the issue of the military. I mean, the military 
does have extraordinary capacity. I guess I would say the military has been involved. I know in a number of states, the National Guard has played a vital role given their logistical capabilities, their organizational capabilities, and they, they've been really important. I, I think it is appropriate to think about um, crises like COVID, the pandemic, as a national issue that requires a national response. And of course, it's a security issue, so fully mobilizing. Um, the military to participate makes sense to me. But I think we we have to be wary of reflexively dumping onto the military a variety of roles for which they're neither fully trained nor which have to do with their mission. So the military does have great logistical capability, great uh, organizational capability, but they're not diplomats. Therefore, they shouldn't necessarily be expected to do the work of the State Department. They're not, by definition, public health officials. So they shouldn't have to take up that role. And that's just a long-winded way of saying, I think the military has to be part of the solution. They've long been involved in humanitarian efforts domestically and internationally. They're an important resource of talent and, and skill, but we can't, as we've done with so many other things in recent years, try to militarize effectively a response and expect the military to be the ones who are gonna solve the entire problem. Great, um, that's a good note. We are a couple of minutes over, so I'm gonna uh, just end there. I wanna make just two or three reflections that I've heard from all of you. And again, sorry to go over, and I know you're all extraordinarily busy. Um, I think the, the points around trust, Ed, are absolutely central. And um, that has come up over and over again, is the ability to create trust with the system. It actually gets to a point that Janaid made earlier about the person and the state and where is that trust the greatest. And it may be much more local, maybe much more city than it is some national. And the other part that I do think is worth emphasizing is that the global architecture has gotten uh, mixed up in the, in the middle of this pandemic, jumbled up, and probably it was time that it needed to happen. We need to rethink the whole approach. Um, and uh, this is really accelerating a, a longstanding uh, pattern of much more intellectual uh, leadership and governance uh, leadership from places outside of where we have kind of mentally thought that stuff comes from. Uh, I don't know if it ever came from there, but to the extent that that was our mental model, it no longer will work. So uh, this has been an extraordinarily like useful, interesting conversation. I want to say thank you to all of you. Uh, particularly those of you who are joining from far away because it's late in the evening. Uh, and so I'm extremely grateful. And thank you to the uh, Brown team for organizing this, pulling this together. Uh, Janaid, Lois, uh, John, Ed, thank you all for joining. Uh, we are going to have some difficult months and years ahead in reimagining all of this, but I think we can land in a much better place uh, if we do our job right. So thank you for all the stuff you do in this. Be well. <laughs>